Hey, good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest podcast, presented as always by our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions, local trusted since 1999. Give them a call today for a free estimate. It's at 865-524-5888 or online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. I'm Eric Kane alongside Grant Ramey, Austin Price, and Rob Lewis. Got a bevy of topics to get into today. Tennessee versus the NCAA. The responses from the TRO on the NCAA side, then the plaintiff side, got a court date for February 13th. Uh, Tennessee basketball had a major win over Kentucky at Rupp Arena, where they had to rewrite some of the history books in favor of Tennessee over Kentucky. And then we'll talk a little recruiting, but first, Austin Price, let's hit on the latest developments from over the weekend. The first of this week, Tennessee versus the NCAA. We do know a court date has been scheduled, and it's been a lot of he said, she said, a lot of responses from one side to the other. Not a whole lot of anything different since Friday or Thursday of last week, but a lot of talking. Yeah, it's going to be more down to what does the judge see with the temporary restraining order. And and you would think that you're going to get that decision you know, coming up today on this Tuesday. Um, you know, and then of course, if everything goes, you know, Tennessee's way, the state of Tennessee's way, yeah, you would, you will know, you'll see everybody convened in Greenville lawyers only lawyers only no, no fans. Um, at least that's what everybody's pushing, um, you know, next Tuesday. But, uh, you know, it, it's what you'd expect, right, Grant? I mean, it's, you know, this is why we need the TRO. The NCAA says wild, wild west, word salad, word salad. And, and honestly, just changed a few words from kind of their pitch to the uh, the TRO on the two-time transfer that they lost back, you know, 45, 50 days ago um, in West Virginia. And then, of course, Tennessee countered again with, you know, the NCAA is governing a world that does not exist. Yeah, and I, I really don't know what to make of the kind of the step-by-step developments of this thing or how it's going to play out. But I do think if you're Dondi, if you're Danny White, you're too smart, you're you're too good at your job to put out the statements they've put out and, and put out the venom they've basically put out against the NCAA as, as strongly as they've worded all their statements and all their responses to not feel good about their case or what they have to prove or, you know, feeling like the NCAA can't or, or will be will not be able to prove whatever they're trying to prove and, and regulate what was an unregulated world at the time where they're trying to go back and enforce these rules, it feels like in hindsight. So, I mean, I, I don't know kind of what's going to happen here step by step or how long the process is going to take out. I also didn't expect the NCAA to be working on a Saturday and putting out a statement, but I guess they had a deadline to meet. So maybe it's going to be a little bit more expedited than I thought, but Surely Tennessee thinks uh, the way they've handled this thing publicly and the statements they've put out, uh, they've got a pretty good case and they feel pretty good about where they stand as this thing kind of plays out in uh, the step-by-step process here. Well, Rob, I don't think they do that. Uh, to Grant's point, I don't think they do that unless they feel good about everything they have. And Tennessee has seen the uh, draft of the notice of allegations. Again, all schools kind of get that ahead of time. Sometimes it does not come. Tennessee's yet to receive that notice of allegations as of uh, this Tuesday morning. So, you know, does it come? We'll see. I think a lot of it depends on kind of how this thing plays out over the next seven to 10 to 14 days. Yeah, AP, that's the thing I can come back to more and more is not, you know, whatever the facts of the case may be or whatever the allegations, but it's the two people that are, you know, as respected in their industry, you know, as, you know, ha- have the reputation that, that Dondi and, and, and Danny White have. I, you know, I just, not for a second do I think all this strong language is bluster. You know, I, you know, I think they generally, like like you say, I mean, I, I think they feel very confident that, you know, they, they were on the right side of this thing or um, or at least, you know, have, have an argument that it, that is certainly going to hold up in, in, in court. And, and, and just base that on everything we've, we've seen from, from Dondi Plowman and Danny in, in how they've guided this, you know, athlete department through some, some really tricky times over the last three years to, and, and, and look at where it is now and not just in football, but, you know, all over the board and just, you know, when those two are coming out swinging like that, I just like everybody else have a very hard time believing that they don't feel like that they, they stand on pretty firm ground. Not to get too far down deep into the weeds here, but you know, a couple of the highlights from the responses from over the weekend uh, and, and the plaintiff's response to the NCAA. Uh, one of the big selling points essentially was, and this is, I'm just taking a quote from the story from, from the, that, uh, that response, the NCAA cannot benefit from the fact that its rules scattered across 437 page manual are often impenetrable, shifting and vague on the other side, the day before the NCAA was reminding the plaintiffs like, Hey, 
I don't care what you say. You know, that there's there's been a, an SEC representative on our Division One Council, and these member institutions have agreed to follow these rules. So that that was kind of one of the big highlights over the weekend in both those responses. Austin saying, you know, your rules are vague, but then the NCAA saying, well, you agree to follow them, and you know that's something that they'll obviously discuss in court. Well, the the biggest issue here is the fact that you know so much of the NIL rules are you know have, have were either not in place in the time uh, frame that they are investigating. Um, and have since changed, right? And again, which goes back to Grant's point a minute ago, they're trying to retroactively go back and change the speed limit and give out tickets. Like, you know, it, it, it's one of those deals where, like, you know, I think the longer this, you know, plays out, I think you're going to see Tennessee is in a really good spot here because I think that, you know, they know exactly what they have from a, from an evidence standpoint. Um, I think they feel really good about it. And if you go back to Donnie's original statement, what did she say? None of our coaches or student athletes broke any rules. And then she went as far, far as to back up Spire. And so, like, I think that, again, I think this comes back down to the gray areas that the NCAA let become bigger gray areas, um, you know, a few years ago when, you know, name, image, and likeness was passed by the Supreme Court. And, you know, they kind of let this – spiral and unravel themselves and now they're trying to kind of put it back together well umpty dumpty when he breaks he didn't you know <laughs> no, no, no putting it back together again so i mean like it's it is what it is um but at the same time like you know i think, I think if you're tennessee you feel really good about you know kind of where things stand again it's not a lock slam dunk but i think you feel really good about kind of where you're at with this process you you mentioned the, the you know in terms of the humpty dumpty analogy i mean it's the it's the analogy we've heard a lot the last two years. It's, you know, toothpaste is out of the bottle. You can't literally put it back in. That's kind of where you're at right now. That's what the NCAA is trying to do. Uh, going back to something you said a moment ago, Austin, in terms of the notice of allegations, at the time of this recording, again, it has not come out. Do you think that th they could slow play this notice of allegations to literally wait until after the court date on February 13th, depending on how that goes, if Tennessee receives a notice of allegations? Or do you think it's more likely Tennessee will receive those before the court date? Yeah, I think that it behooves the NCAA to kind of push it back, right? Because okay. I think when you think about it, and it maybe maybe it comes later today, you know, who knows? But it, I think it behooves them to push it back because at the end of the day, the state of Tennessee and the state of Virginia took legal action against the NCAA to kind of head things off at the pass. Much like the NCAA leaked the story to Pat Forty to what? Get out ahead of it and head it off at the pass because they knew Tennessee was going to push back. And so um, they wanted to try to, you know, kind of, drag Tennessee down in the mud from a perception standpoint, it didn't really work. I mean, outside of the initial, like, hour, once Dondi came out firing, I mean, who's really been on the side of the NCAA in this deal? Not many national media people have been going, oh, man, you know, Tennessee's guilty. I mean, most people are like, this is crap. Most opposing fan bases say, well, this is crap. If this was Alabama or Georgia, I would tell you it's crap. Like, I think it, at the end of the day, like, you have too much going on behind the scenes. Coaches negotiating deals, uh, collectives announcing – kids with deals as soon as the kid commits like i mean like we're all to think that the kid just went there not knowing what he was going to get and there was no discussion ahead of time um you know so with, with this notice allegations i do think it behooves them to wait because they can always go yeah we were investigating but but you know we didn't really find anything they decided to sue us we weren't really going to go down that road and they can kind of like you know try to walk it back a little bit so i do think it behooves them to wait and kind of see how this plays out um, in federal court in Greenville. You got the collective of at Ohio State that you're referencing, Caleb Downs transferring, you know, to Ohio State. And simultaneously, when he's announced, the collective is announcing the signing of C Caleb Downs. Yeah. You got, Rob, you got Caden Proctor, who is being interviewed by a local television station at an Iowa basketball game a couple weeks ago after he committed to Iowa from the transfer portal. And he flat out said, hey, they never stopped talking to me. They never stopped recruiting me. So it very much is the wild, wild west. But in the short term, Rob, as we kind of move on from this, from the day-to-day -day operations for Tennessee football and recruiting and all that, I mean, nothing's really changed. They've kind of been navigating these waters for the last couple of years and essentially reassuring current players, prospective student athletes, like, Hey, we're open for business and and we're going to, you know, we, we, we are going to act as if nothing's going to come of this because they don't believe anything will come of this. Yeah. I mean, I, to me, it just, and, and maybe I'm being naive and, and, and a simpleton, it just doesn't feel like it's like, it's that big of a deal. Like it's some ominous, you know, nebulous cloud hanging over the program like it felt 
you know, three or yeah. three or four years ago. I mean, it just sure. doesn't feel like that at all. I mean, it, it, it just feels like a blip. And, and also, you know, there's, there's, there's no outrage from other fan bases about this. I mean, I think every, it might be too strong to say everybody wants Tennessee to, to get a win on this, but you know, I think the majority of college football fans would just like some clarity, you know, would, would just, you know, like to know where, where the line is. And, and, and I, you know, I, I think NIL for the most part, it, people have accepted it. It's part of, it's part of the landscape and, you know, let, let's, let's deal with it. I and mean, this is, seems frivolous to me. I, th- I think if you're a fan of another, or another program in general, uh, you better be pulling for Tennessee because if this thing goes against Tennessee and uh, ends poorly, what, what's to say they're not going to go after whichever school's next on the line? I mean, Tennessee, it's yeah. not like Tennessee's out here on a limb by themselves, you know, operating and how they're being accused of operating. I mean, this, this is, this is something where if, if one's guilty, there's probably a lot of people guilty. Yeah, right? just, like Danny Grant, referenced. Yeah. Granny brings up, or Grant brings up, a, I'd say Granny. <laughs> I am kind of old. Grant brings up a great point. It, it, to, to Rob's point, three years ago, Tennessee was on the limb on their own, and they're not now. And that's why this whole thing is different, as Rob uh, referenced. Yeah, you've already been down to Florida State. You're currently checking into Florida. You're currently checking into Miami. Um, you know, heard rumors of some other Southeastern Conference schools that they'd be knocking on the door to next, or at least we become, you know, public knowledge that they're already kind of poking around there. So Tennessee is certainly not on a ledge by itself to you guys and what you're saying. And we'll let um, you know, Eric, when you can get those power duo, the Grant Danny t-shirts, the granny t-shirts, <laughs> we'll buy those. We'll, we'll sell those along with our Volquest hoodies that everybody wants and, and we'll make a fortune here. Uh, moving on a little bit. We'll talk hoops here in just a second. Cause there's a lot to talk about there, but I do want to hit on the recruiting weekend junior day, a couple weeks ago because of the weather uh, was canceled for the majority of the guys coming in via vehicle. Uh, there were some guys that came in there in the month of January, um, you know, th- through flights that were already scheduled. But Junior Day this past weekend, a lot of a lot of really talented players: Cam Sparks, Ethan Utley from inside the state of Tennessee, a top 100 tackle, and Jalen Matthews. Uh, you got a couple other defensive linemen like Bryce Jenkins. Um, what what's to make of what happened over the weekend in terms of the Junior Day, Austin? Really solid uh, day. I thought Tennessee uh, did themselves. Uh, you know, a lot of solids with guys like Bryce Jenkins, Ethan Utley, uh, Joe Kim Dodson's the one I think probably is, uh, you know, you know, trending the most. Um, and he's been that way. He, he really likes Tennessee a lot, the wide receiver from Memphis. And that's the cool thing about Tennessee. You know, you're going to take probably four receivers in this class. Um, you've got three in the state that you really like and Cam Sparks, Joe Kim Dodson and Renarius Jackson. And then let's say you go out and get those three done. Then you can just kind of go swing for the fences with Marcus Harris at, at you know, out there at modern day with, with Caleb Cunningham, with Jamie French, some of those big timers that are out there. So, I mean, like, I think that's a real, um, a nice feather in your cap for Josh Heupel in this class. You've got three receivers in this class. You really like, but the Dodson, you know, feel like Tennessee's in a great spot with him uh, exiting junior day. And then, uh, you know, Jalen Matthews is a monster. I mean, that is a big, big kid. 2026 offensive lineman, Leo Delaney, um, Matt and I, uh, Technically, they're already in the state of North Carolina because we take this on Monday. Um, you know, we will be seeing uh, Leo Delaney, big twenty twenty six, who plays on the opposite side of David Sanders at Providence Day. But Matthews is uh, a big kid from the state of New Jersey, um, big and physical. Uh, the Babaloa kid uh, from Kansas, another kid that you know is really really impressive. Um, you know, from the tackle spot. So I feel like Tennessee's got a bigger, broader board at the offensive tackle spot this year in 2025. And I think part of that is, you know, I think they've expanded the board some. I think George's reach is, is you know, making a difference. Um, and so, you know, I, I like kind of what Tennessee got done this past weekend, um, specifically um, with the offensive linemen, both Matthews, Babaloba, and then the 2026, Leo Delaney, all three of which I think Tennessee really impressed. And then, of course, Tennessee's going to keep swinging at guys like David Sanders, I'm going to keep swinging at Juan Gaston, uh, Josh Petty. Again, I, I, we start rattling off all these names. Only Delaney is a 26. Every one of those others was a 25. And so, you know, to be in the mix, so to speak, with all these kids in early February and, and be a legitimately in the mix, I think is a good sign. Tell us what the the schedule is here in the the near future. I know you guys are going to be out on the road this week, but in, in terms of you have a you have a dead period, 
then you know March will come and they'll have another junior day type situation. Guys coming on campus for for spring practice. Kind of what's what's coming up in the near future? Well, it is. It's it's really day. We'll see if anybody. I, I would say I can definitely see Tennessee pulling a commitment in the month of February. Um, you know, outside of that, things open back up in early March. You'll have junior days. You'll have spring practice. Uh, Tennessee will be trying to get a lot of those kids in here for spring practice. And of course, Tennessee will try to do something around whatever they do with the spring game. If there is no spring game, they do it kind of like uh, from a fan's standpoint, but they do it with recruits like they did two years ago when the stadium was under construction. Um, either way, like it, it's important to get all these players in here as much as you can. Tennessee, you know, is hoping to get, and, and David Sanders has told us he plans to be here in March, probably the end of the month uh, for a big weekend with, uh, with uh, Glenn Ellerby in Tennessee. So, you know, Tennessee will work to try to get all these kids here to campus, you know, when things open back up in the month of March. Tennessee recruiting, it never stops. You got Tennessee versus the NCAA, new developments every single day. And again, a court hearing scheduled for February the 13th. We'll continue to get you information on that. Tennessee basketball, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. Uh, a lot going on right there. No better time to be following us and subscribing to us over at VolQuest.com. Uh, for everything you need to know, the standard of Tennessee Volunteers coverage, that is VolQuest.com. I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over Exterior Home Solutions for making all this coverage here on the podcast possible. Your roof, it's the most important protection against nature for your home or your business. That's why I trust the experts at Exterior Home Solutions. Again, a big thanks to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, 865-524-5888 or online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. They've been local. They've been trusted since 1999. Give them a call today if you have a need for a free estimate. All right, let's get into the exciting news from over the weekend. That was Tennessee scoring 103 points uh, at Rupp Arena against Kentucky. Rob, it was um, uh, you know the, the first of many times under John Calipari in, in terms of you know the, 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 his team allowing that many points. Sakai Ziegler, Josiah Jordan James had career games. Um, it was a total team effort, as you wrote about over on the site a couple of days ago. What a win for Tennessee, a huge win over a rival on the road, and now Tennessee picks up win number six in Southeastern Conference play. Yeah, it's it's enormous. I mean, this is not a, a great Kentucky team, you know, certainly by their standards, but that doesn't you know, diminish, you know, what Tennessee did and, you know, winning a rup again the, the fourth time in, in the last seven years. Um, you know, Santi and, and Josiah, as Grant as mentioned, you picked up their third win of their careers. I mean, that's pretty, it's special. I mean, just the way that this rivalry has flipped, you know, what is it? Rick's got, got 11 wins in this series. Tennessee had, had that many in, in 30 plus years, you know, before 2015. And, um, there was, there was nothing fluky, you know, about that game at all. Tennessee was the better team. I mean, Kentucky, you know, hung around. I mean, they're, they're good. They're very talented, but, you know, Tennessee to, to me was, was clearly, the better team, and that was a big time game. I mean, whoever lost that one was was looking at, at a two game losing streak. Really hurt your chances of winning the SEC. Um, you know, Tennessee still has some work to do. Thanks to that the loss at South Carolina, but the bounce back from that home loss to go up there and win, you know, in a in a pressure cooker on national TV. I just I just thought it was a, a real statement from from Tennessee. And Grant, if not for Dillingham and his heroics and his, what, six made three-pointers, 35-point game for Kentucky, I mean, it could have been a whole lot worse. Tennessee could have won that one by 20-plus. Yeah, he was. He took 20 shots from the field. He made 14 of them. I mean, that was the kind of heater that he was on for the entire game. And, uh, I mean, I agree with Rob. Kentucky's not great, but they're elite offensively. They can put up points. I mean, they can erase a 14-point deficit in no time, and then they can give up a 14-0 run in no time because they're that bad defensively. I mean, it, it did look like kind of like routes on air in terms of just how open Tennessee was getting, how easy Tennessee could make it look on the offensive end at times. And honestly, I didn't really expect Tennessee to win that game going in because I knew they were going to have to score 90-plus points to beat Kentucky, and it's tough to do that on the road. It's tough to hit enough shots, especially when you're coming off a 59-point game uh, at home against South Carolina a few days before that. And, and it felt like, a you know, uh, it was going to be a tough thing to respond from. But the, the way they came out, the 8-0 uh, start to the game, the 13-3, and then Cal's got to take a timeout. And and I think Rob said it in the final minute there, you know, Rupp Arena is emptying. You, you just don't see that a lot, especially with Tennessee. I mean, Tennessee hasn't won up there a ton like Rob was talking about. I think they were 4-35 and 35 in Rupp Arena before Rick got to Tennessee, and now they're 4-5. and five in their last nine uh, at Rupp during the Barnes era. So that just kind of puts the historical perspective on how, how rare it is to win there. But 
not only that, to score 100 plus uh, as an SEC team in that building for the first time in 30 plus years. And now people are talking about, well, people that cover Kentucky are talking about Cal better do something in March or maybe this thing's gone south or run its course or maybe there needs to be changes made. I mean, that's where that kind of loss kind of sent Kentucky and they've lost three out of four and they're in a tough spot. But Tennessee would have been in a tough spot too if they'd lost that and dropped back-to-back games against South Carolina and Kentucky last week. So for them to go on the road, score it the way they did and, and not rely on Dalton Connect scoring 30 or 40 or whatever, um, the balance of production they had, uh, that was why in, in my eyes it was a huge, huge response. Yeah, and I, I, I don't mean to hijack it. AP, everybody weigh in. I, and I'm not you know, trying to pile on Kentucky or, or anything like that. But And I, I mentioned this in the 3 2 one that was on Monday. Man, if you just had to pick which program is healthier right now and in a better spot, I, I think it's Tennessee. I mean, Grant, you, you referenced you know, the fans and the media saying, you know, Cal's got to do something in March. And, that you know, that place was – as soon as they had a reason the other night, that place was empty which you, you don't see often, you know, I, I think the one and done stuff it, w- without a, b- a lot of success from all the one and done stuff in, in, in March and, and Cal's kind of, you know, the things like skipping the coaches show when you make $10, $10 million a year, I'm just, and it, you know, Kentucky is an elite blue blood program, fantastic history and tradition. I'm just talking about right now today, Tennessee feels like a healthier program t- to me. Well, well it is. And, and I think part of that is it's years and years and years of the one and done culture. Because it is hard to kind of flip it around. Now, I do think it when you can technically like Connect's going to be a one and done, right? Because he's he's out of eligibility, but he's an older guy. And those what do those freshmen do? They hit walls. They're emotional. They kind of ride the wave. Sometimes I mean, when things are great, boom. When things are bad, they go in the tank. I mean, I, one of the greatest stats I heard was on Matt Jones doing his his deal afterwards. Only eight times. In the history of Kentucky basketball, have they lost back-to-back games at home? Three of the eight are since since COVID. So, like he's talking about the decline of the program, and you know they they dropped two down in a row after they lost, you know, the other night to Florida, and then of course to Tennessee. So, like it, that's to me very very telling about kind of where this thing is headed at Kentucky. To your point, Rob, that is not going in the normal Kentucky type direction. I mean, they haven't been out the first weekend in, I, I can't tell you how long, 15, 16, something like that. Um, and, and listening to Cal postgame talk about a young team making mistakes. To the media, like, not on this radio show, to the like, media. Yeah, I wanted to like bang my head against the wall. Like, you built this thing over and over. This is what you've done for however many years on end now, where you're, you're going to win the offseason, have the best – people are going to talk about the best recruiting class in the history of college basketball year after year with Kentucky – because it's a bunch of five stars, one and duns, and Cal's going to be all over the uh, the green room on draft night. He's going to be, you know, when all these guys are getting drafted and all this stuff. But it's hard to beat veteran teams, older teams, fifth-year guys like Santi and Josiah and a, a Dalton who's 22, 23, whatever he is. Like, it's hard to win college basketball games with a bunch of 18-year-olds, a bunch of one-and-done kids. They might be elitely talented. And, and some of the best five-star prospects to ever come out of the you know uh, high school ranks, but it's just hard to win consistently. And, and they could they could go on a run to the Final Four. Miami had the same exact blueprint last year, where they were elite offensively, they were ranked around 100 defensively, and the the matchups worked, and everything went down the line in March, and they made a run to the Final Four. And Kentucky could do that, and Cal would be back, and he'd be the king again, and K- Kentucky would be back on top and all that stuff, or they could have another first round, second round exit. And, and they could be talking about, man, is this it for this guy? So you had Dalton connect who's averaging what? 31, 32 points over his last six games, whatever it was. And uh, he came out and he scored 16 points, five of 14 shooting. Uh, you had Zakai Ziegler and Josiah Jordan James, who were really bad offensively in South Carolina. Josiah Jordan James has struggled on the offensive end for, for weeks now. They put up career high, 26 points. Zakai Ziegler, a double, double 13 assists. Josiah Jordan James made four three uh, pointers, and and Grant, as you were mentioning, you know since the game, I mean he was what one of eighteen from three mm-hmm. in SEC play entering the game. Um, I mean what a moment for, and, and again, it's something we talked about back in November that like it doesn't have to be connect every single night, it doesn't have to be the same guy every single night, but it's so good to see on the road in SEC play against a rival, a rival where some of these veterans that have been big for you at points and times on the offensive end that have been a little quieter, at least in Josiah's case, step up to the moments and not back down, and, and you're the reason you won this basketball game. I mean, 
just what what a game there by both Zakai Ziegler and Josiah Jordan James. Uh, phenomenal performance when Dalton Connect. I mean, he wasn't nothing. He had 16 points, but he certainly wasn't you know what he was the last you know five six games. Yeah, he looked like he was forcing it a little bit. He had a corner three there early on that didn't go down, and he was kind of on some of the drives. It looked like he was trying to draw contact and, and not really worrying about finishing at the rim. And it just looked like he sometimes he 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 tries to do a little bit too much, which it's hard to blame him for doing that because we've seen how productive he can be, but. For Zakai to go 0 for 6 against South Carolina and play two, uh, score two points in like 33 minutes and, and one of the worst games we've seen from him during his Tennessee career and to come out and I think he started 5 for 5 uh, from the field at Kentucky, 4 for 4 at the three-point line, something like that. And, and yeah, I think since Joe, since the last time he made more than one three in a game, he was 2 for 23 from the three-point line. And that went back to like late December. Uh, to non-conference play. So for him to come out and, and hit shots, not only did he score it the way he did, but time after time he was hitting a big shot. He had the big response. I uh, mean, Rob, me and you talked about that after the game. Like when they needed a big shot, they went to Joe and Joe found a way to hit it. And that's was, huge for them because they got to have that. I was going to say, Rob, I thought the best thing going is, is Josiah. I mean, how much have we seen in the last month, month and a half where he's had open looks, whether it be from three or even inside the three-point line, and he has just been gun shy to shoot from a confidence standpoint. And even the other night, there was one point late in the game, Tennessee was up, I think, 11 or whatever still, and he kind of – he he probably could have got the shot off, but he decided to pump fake, and he took a step to the right, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, he has got he went gun shy for all of a sudden. Then he fired it and made it, and th that's something he wasn't even doing last Tuesday, much less, you know – the last several weeks. So, I mean, don't you think that this game kind of puts the confidence back as it should? Oh, I would, I would, you would have to think so just, you know, as, as well as he played, but you know, I, <laughs> he's been up and down before and I, and I don't want to, I'm not being critical of Josiah, but I mean, I just, there was no way to predict that. I mean, Grant was throwing out some stats. I had a, but I, you know, I looked up a bunch of stuff for the, for the three, two, one AP to your point about, you know the confidence. You know he had a he, he had a really rough stretch to start SEC play. He was one of eight at Mississippi State. He was two and nine at Georgia. And after after that little stretch, that's three of seventeen in two games. I mean he he just quit looking at the basket. The next four games, he took a total of eleven shots, and he takes eighteen at, at Kentucky. And in the in the in the six games before Saturday, he had thirteen total points, and he doubles that in, in, in one game. I mean it's. I mean, it just came out of nowhere. I mean, I, I, I couldn't have been less surprised as Akai played well. I mean, I didn't think he was going to subject K Kentucky to that level of violence. But would not surprised he, he played well. But, man, I mean, Josiah stood that – not that he had a good game, but that he dropped 26 points and took 18 shots and, you know, hit four threes. That was just a, a tour de force. Yeah, not only that, he became in the, in the win. He had five rebounds, given the 12th Tennessee player ever to reach 750 uh, career rebounds. Just an all around good game for him. Um, Tennessee takes down Kentucky. Tennessee will return uh, back to Thompson Bowling Arena. Food City Center will take on LSU on Wednesday. We'll hit the road for College Station against Texas AM on Saturday. Grant, what's this team need to do? What's kind of the storylines for this week uh, heading into LSU and Texas AM? Uh, consistency. Don't have a 59 point Tuesday and 103 point Saturday. I mean, they, they the schedule lines up right here where you better take care of business. You better next. stack up some W's at they G. Yeah, you better go six and zero. Oh, whatever it is, you got LSU, Texas A and M, Arkansas, the like, uh, Vanderbilt again, uh, and then you look at those final four games of the schedule. You host Auburn. You go to Alabama. You go to South Carolina, and you host Kentucky. And, and that's the four game run into the postseason. So. Uh, you better win some basketball games between here and there, and then you better have a pretty good four-game stretch because you don't want to get beat up in that last two weeks of the regular season and go into the postseason doing some soul-searching or whatever and trying to figure out what kind of team you are. Um, I didn't think that South Carolina return trip was going to be so tough, uh, no, but they're a little bit better than I expected. I mean, they're fortunate to get Auburn at home because it's really, really tough to win at Auburn. It's going to be tough to win at Alabama and then senior day against Kentucky. Uh, you're going to have to win that game because it's senior day against Kentucky and you just went to Rupp and, and did what you did. But the way the schedule sets up, you better play some consistent basketball, like Rob said, and stack up some wins. I meant to make mention of this earlier, Rob, but uh, Cameron Carr got got a little bit of run uh, in that Jeez. basketball game, three minutes. What what was the reason for that, and what did what did uh, Rick Barnes think that he I brought mean, to the table, and why he, he wanted to use him in that situation? He pretty apparently has, has passed Freddie Gillard, and and I you know, and Grant seen it too. I mean, Cam's had 
you know, a couple, he's been getting some run with the, with the quote unquote orange team in practice. But, uh, you know, to me, it, it, that had happened before last Friday when we saw it and, and Cam still hadn't, hadn't played, but, you know, Saturday was, was a pretty strong statement that, that he's the, the next guy up on the perimeter and he's, he's past Freddie and, you know, he, he didn't play great, but man, he, he certainly, you know, he, he had a big time assist to Josiah on the alley-oop and, I guess you know he he did he didn't hurt himself with his what he played three minutes, uh, yeah, I, I right. guess. Um, so I would you know you come in and and don't you know you know what down your leg in that situation a, a, as a freshman you know it, the only time you've been in any kind of situation like that close and you know hold up do what you're supposed to do. I mean I, I would say more opportunities are probably coming for him. And I'm sure Rick will be asked about this uh, the next time he talks, but. Uh, I just happen to be looking at the Tennessee bench right before Cam goes in, and, and Justin Ganey gets up and, and walks over and, and says something to Rick in Rick's ear, and Rick shakes his head, and they, they go get Cam. So I don't know what it was that Justin Ganey saw in that moment, why they needed Cam, if it's foul trouble, if it was trying to defend the three-point line better, something like that. Uh, but to Cam's credit, that first that first uh, defensive possession he was in on the game, they kind of went right at him. He stood his ground. He played good defense, and then he came up with that loose ball and, and had the presence of the mind to, to throw the lob to Joe. Uh, and to make that play. So that was, I mean, it felt like we hadn't seen Cam Carr since non-conference, basically. So for him to come in on that, in that stage, in that moment, in that arena, it was pretty impressive. And and despite the the win where you score 103 points at Rupp Arena, according to ESPN's Joe Lenardi, Grant, the Tennessee, it, it's deserving to be a number one seed right now in his projections, but it's not going to be because those right. Houston and, and Carolina aren't moving. No, and, and it's, it's one of those things where there's probably – five number one seeds and, and there's going to be somebody left out and, and that there's that's not the worst thing in the world to be the the, the top number two seed um especially at this time of year uh, north carolina and, and obviously houston lost on saturday and people are wondering why they're sticking there and north carolina lost at georgia tech well tennessee lost at home against south carolina on tuesday that's the that's what it is this time of year there's a lot of losses and the metrics love houston they're number one in the net they've got six quad one wins and then you look at north carolina uh, they're pretty good, and, and they beat Tennessee head to head uh, in November, late November. So it's it's one of those things where do you really want a number one seed, or you you find being at the top of the number two seed line? I think that's a good thing. North Carolina goes from the championship game to nothing last year, back to being right in the mix for a chance to go again. It, it just this. I mean, you're talking about riding the wave. I mean, gee, North Car- North Carolina, the, the basketball gods are rewarding for North Carolina for saying we're too good to play in NIT. We're literally taking our ball and going home. To now they're going to be right back to being the number one seed in the NCAA tournament. And the in the year they went to the uh, to the to the championship, I mean that, that they made a run, right? I mean they weren't a one two three seed, uh, were no. they like a five, oh, yeah. six seed or something? Yeah, they had a, a big upset of um was it, was it Baylor, right? Yeah, I think so. It was Hubert Davis's first year, so yeah. it was a, yeah, it was not an expected run. Uh, I think they beat. I think to- they beat Baylor at the as a, as an eight seed. I want to say in the in the second round, Baylor was. I think yeah, Baylor was the one. Right. That sounds yeah. right. All right, so we got plenty of coverage since the basketball. Again, what a win over Kentucky, but the season does go on. Back home against LSU, then on the road at College Station. You got uh, everything and more regarding the developments in Tennessee versus the NCAA, and uh, we'll talk about all that over at VolQuest.com. Awesome prize. Give a little tease on what you and Matt Ray have coming up this week. You guys are going to hit the road and have tons and tons of recruiting coverage. That's right. We're in the state of North Carolina as we speak. Um we are seeing uh, the top uh, offensive tackle in the country. We're seeing David Sanders. We're seeing his teammate, Leo Delaney, who's a 2026. We're seeing safety, Jordan Young. Um, we're seeing several 2026, uh, Brody Keefe, um, you know, Elijah Littlejohn over at West Charlotte. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of players. Then we're going to swing up to Greensboro and uh, see uh, Faison Brandon, uh, one of the top 2026 quarterbacks, and uh, Kendry Harrison, who is a uh, freak tight end, 2026. All that and more over at VolQuest.com, the standard for Tennessee football, recruiting, basketball, baseball coverage, and more. No better time to join us over on the site than right now. Big thanks to Exterior Home Solutions for uh, presenting this uh, podcast with us here today. For a free estimate, give them a call today. Pick up that phone, 865-524-5888, or you can visit them online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. They've been local and trusted since 1999. If you have needs for roofing, siding, windows, or garage, Contact Exterior Home Solutions today. For Grant Ramey, Austin Price, Rob Lewis, I'm Eric Kane. Thanks so much for joining us here on the VolQuest Podcast. <laughs>